Good morning, everyone. We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Welcome back to our study of Pastor Brian Wolfmuller's Has American Christianity Failed? Again, this is what the book looks like for those of you studying at home. We are in the chapter on Holy Scripture, which happens to be chapter 2. We left off on page 45, but let's get ourselves brought back into the context by turning back to page 43. Here on page 43, uh, Wolfmuller introduces three aspects of Scripture where American Christianity fails in their confession, in their understanding, in their usage. Now, he had previously mentioned um, three others. That Holy Scripture is inspired, inerrant, and infallible, and largely commends the Christian church here in America. Of course, the mainline denominations fall away from these things due to higher criticism, but most of the, uh, most of the other churches retain um, these three categories, inspired, inerrant, infallible. Now, the ones that he points out on 43 where there is lacking across the board is one, clarity, two, sufficiency, and three, efficacy. So last week we looked at clarity, page 43 and 44. And just to refresh your mind on this, the clarity of the scripture, I think two examples were brought up, if memory serves, or maybe in our discussion. But one was the phenomenon of getting together in Bible study and asking the question, what does this verse mean to you? If it means something to you that's something different from what it means to me, then what we are positively confessing is that the scriptures lack clarity, or that clarity is to be found in the, in the subject, in the individual reading the text. All right? But more perniciously and more broadly, we have this kind of ethos going on in American Christianity. And you can see this in the middle of page 44, the really large font type. American Christianity finally denies the clarity of Scripture by denying theological certainty. Yeah, so here's the more formal point. Wolf Mueller continues, it sounds like this. I'm not Lutheran or Presbyterian, I'm Christian. This is saying I don't think we can know with certainty whose teaching is correct. The unclarity of the scriptures abounds when small group Bible studies are centered on the question, yeah, here we go, what does this text mean to you? The unclarity of the scriptures flourishes when theological assertions are labeled opinions or the opinions of men. Well, clearly we see this in the mess and muddle of all the thousands upon thousands of denominations here in America, um, we see a, a failure to confess the clarity of the scriptures. Um, even one step along the spectrum of sanity would, would be to say that the scriptures are clear and that's precisely why I am a Lutheran or a Presbyterian or a Roman Catholic and not one of the others. That would be at least one step on the spectrum toward a more sane and realistic view, simply asserting, well, we can't know, or any of these, doc any of these doctrinal differences are just man-made, synthetic, um, and uh, are opinions of men or something like that. That's, that's one step worse. That's one step more toward spiritual insanity. All right, so not to... Uh, continue beating a horse we've already beaten last week. Um, that's clarity. Any, any um, residual questions, comments, thoughts you have on that point? Or are we ready to move forward? Very good. So page 45. Now Wolfmuller introduces us to the topic of sufficiency. 
and I think this is a very important one. The scriptures are sufficient. The Lord has given us all that we need in the prophetic and apostolic scriptures. That tends to be shorthand for Old and New Testament scriptures. The Bible is enough. Everything we need for life and salvation is found in scripture. Nothing more is necessary. The clarity and the sufficiency of the scriptures go together. They stand together or they fall together. The Roman Catholic Church denies the sufficiency of the scriptures, teaching that the doctrine of the church expands and grows. Hmm. That's an interesting, an interesting statement, isn't it? In what sense might we, um, might we take this language of doctrine expanding or growing? How, how would we understand that wrongly? That's the point that Wolfmuller is addressing, where the Roman Catholic Church sees this as a development, and he's critical of that. How might we see this kind of development or expansion of doctrine positively? or correctly. How might we see that? Any thoughts? There's there's a hand. Well, in the upper room, didn't Jesus say that uh, the Holy Spirit will come and will teach you more than what uh, I have taught you and reveal to you more truth? Is that Sure, possible? sure. There's a start. There's a start. So in the revelation of Jesus to his disciples, now think historically, let's just assume for the sake of our conversation uh, that Jesus is on the cross and raised in his 33rd year. Okay? Then in his 33rd year, he is uh, telling his disciples, everything I've taught you, the Holy Spirit's going to come and give you even more. That takes place at Pentecost. After his death on the cross, three days later, he's raised. And uh, for 40 days, he is with his disciples, showing himself risen to over 500 eyewitnesses. And then he ascends into heaven. On the 50th day, Pentecost, he sends his Holy Spirit, pours out his Holy Spirit. And the proclamation of the gospel of Christ crucified and risen begins in earnest. And the fullness of that that we have encapsulated for us, we would refer to as the apostolic scriptures, the New Testament in short. And so that then becomes the fullness. Now, how might, how might we say that even, even that deposit has a sense of expanding, not in a bad way, but in a good and right and proper way? Any other ideas? There's a, there's a hand over here. Oh, you missed, you missed back here. This was, sorry, this was first. <laughs> We need, we need everybody to have a buzzer. So it goes. Um, like the creeds or when there's error in there? Yeah, church? exactly. So, so it's, it's when Satan attacks and the church is forced to defend the biblical position. In defending that position, more is explored and discovered. Now, it's not new stuff, but it would be, it would be analogous to, um, so like, like I'm going to use a terrible analogy here, but imagine if you've got you've got um, a plant, okay, a little tiny a little tiny plant with um, it's green, it's got a little flower on top, okay, and you think, well, that's that's all there is, okay, but then when you go when you go digging, you realize there's a whole root system. Now, has the original thing changed? No, it is what it is. It's always been what it's always been but our understanding of it has now grown, okay? And so it's not the thing itself growing, but it's our perception of the thing. It's our understanding of the thing growing. And doctrine is much like that. In God's word, he gives us the deposit, the fullness of the faith, and that never changes, but we from time to time are given to explore and discover more of what's already there. How do we do that? Well, as Liz mentioned, it's controversy, ironically. It's attack on God's word that actually causes us to understand God's word more thoroughly. Now here you can see that the, the growth, the expansion, isn't in the doctrine proper, it's in us. It's in our perception of the doctrine, you see? But it's a, it's a subtle but very important distinction because otherwise, if we have just a, a ham-fisted kind of reaction of like, well, 
any, any development of doctrine whatsoever, even any perception of the development of doctrine whatsoever is, a, is bad, then Rome is simply going to come and point out the history of the church and how we've got these things called creeds that developed over the years and various edifying and very important theological distinctions so that we don't fall into error. Meditating on this point, in part at least, comes this kind of hyperbolic statement of Luther that the devil is the one who teaches us theology. Why? Because the devil assaults us and pesters us and harasses us, driving us ever more thoroughly into God's word. The devil's constantly saying, well, did, does God say? Did God say? Is that what he really is saying? And so it forces you into that word and into more other parts of scripture to verify that and buttress that. And so in that respect, um, the devil does ironically become a tutor of theology leading us ever more fully into God's word and an expanding revelation of that word. Again, it's taking place within us subjectively, not within the word, not within the deposit. Okay, so I simply want to bring that out um, because it does us no good to have a ham-fisted kind of approach of just not understanding the fullness of the conversation because then, you know, we lend our, it, it creates a, a position of weakness for us when um, a Roman Catholic or other apologist points out the obvious. Yes, please. Yeah. I just wanted to add to what you were saying going along with this. It's always um, kind of exciting for me to hear our theologians when they are being good. They'll always say something like, we stand on the shoulders of those who went before us. Mm -hmm. You know, in other words, they're not deviating or trying to replow that field or whatever. Right. It's, right. it's the same. Yes, exactly right. And, and to your point, that's the Lutheran method of theology is here's what the scriptures say, here's what the fathers say, here's what we say. Three points make a line. Yeah, yeah. And if you're going to denounce this third point, namely our confession, you're going to end up denouncing these fathers and denouncing, you know, that's one of the, one of the great ironies of the Roman Catholic anathemas against the doctrine of the Book of Concord, as these come out in the Council of Trent, uh, and that is that in denouncing our confessions, what's also being denounced are those church fathers that share that opinion, that are quoted positively, to say nothing of the scriptures that underlie them as well. Yeah. Okay, so once more to, once more to Wolf Mueller's point, we're going to see that his point is absolutely true. We do just simply want to have a little bit more sophistication in our understanding. So, um, uh, excuse me, the Roman Catholic Church denies the sufficiency of the scriptures teaching that the doctrine of the church expands and grows. Right, it's our perception of the doctrine which properly expands and grows, not the doctrine itself. Now, what would be, what would be an expansion, and uh, an example of expansion and growth in doctrine? Well, right now what we're seeing, and it, it is a hot button issue within Roman Catholicism, is whether or not we can call Mary the Mediatrix or the Co-Redemptrix. Well, along with who? Christ. What do the scriptures say? That there is one mediator between God and man, our Lord Jesus Christ. So we can immediately recognize this development as not a good development, not organic to the scriptures, contrary to the scriptures, in fact. We have one mediator, one redeemer, our Lord Jesus Christ. But this is an example then of how doctrine expands and grows truly in the Roman Catholic Church, and we want to denounce that the deposit handed down once and for all to the saints is sufficient for them, it's sufficient for us. All right, so that takes us back then to this idea of sufficiency. Let's pick back up then and not just peck on Roman Catholics, but the next line, Wolf Mueller writes, the liberal mainline denominations reject the sufficiency of the scriptures, insisting that the Holy Spirit speaks through culture the charismatic and Pentecostal churches negate the sufficiency of the Holy Scriptures, looking for a quote-unquote new work, a new word or a new revelation from the Holy Spirit. All right, well, you can see how whether then the source of these new teachings is the magisterium or culture or 
supposedly some new work of the Holy Spirit, all three share this in common. The Holy Scriptures written once and for all aren't sufficient. Okay. So we have a nice foundation then laid here by Wolf Mueller. Let's continue. American Christianity has also failed in regards to the sufficiency of scriptures. American Christianity teaches us to look for personal direction from God. Ah, that's the big one. And that's the one that really crosses all denominational boundaries. And in fact, you will even find this, sad to say, within the Lutheran Church here in America. So when we consider these points and principles of American Christianity, the point really isn't to, you know, accuse uh, one denomination of having a monopoly on this bad teaching. It's rather to say that here are some denominations where it's obvious and in fact been codified into their system of theology. But in truth, these principles are such that they infiltrate all of Christianity in America, including, including that of the Lutherans. So, this idea that we have to look for personal direction from God. Wolf Mueller continues, We are put on a constant search for God's individual will for our life. American Christianity teaches that the scriptures are not sufficient to answer the question, what is God's will for my life? According to American Christianity, I have a quote-unquote personal relationship with God, then I need a quote-unquote personal revelation from God. Yeah. Now this can take on different forms depending upon your age, your role, your station in life, but this infiltrates us in this kind of idea of God, God wants me to you know, go to school at this school study this vocation, marry this person, and if I'm not attuned to his will, then I'm going to mess up. How do you find out what his will for you is? No instructions given. If you mess up, you'll know. <laughs> How will you know if you get it right? Uh, even that's up, up for debate, isn't it? So we can see that we're put in this really nebulous position by this theology, which again, if we, just, if we just pull back all the way to the fundamentals, this language of personal relationship with God, how frequently do you see that coming up in the scriptures? Basically never. Basically never. What about, what about then this idea of a, receiving a personal revelation for God, like, Jeremy, I want you to do X, Y, or Z. I mean, again, if you're thinking in terms of the New Testament in particular, even if you're thinking of the Old Testament, and I think maybe this is where some of our perception gets askewed, we see God giving direct commandments to prophets or to kings or to various personages within the Old Testament itself. But what we miss is that there are millions and millions of Israelites who never received such direct revelation. In fact, it's almost as if those direct revelations from God are purposeful in order to bring about the Messiah, the coming of Christ and the revelation of Christ then later through the scriptures. So as we probe into this idea of, uh, you know, we challenge these ideas of a personal relationship with God and personal revelation from God and God's personal will for my individual life, if we sort of look to the scriptures, we're going to find a lot of doubt as to whether these things have any grounding whatsoever. Make sense? All right. I've seen a couple hands come up, so we'll try to get you in order. One, two, three, please. Can it be that the uh, idea of a personal relationship with Christ is in response to when he says to his disciples, uh, from now on I call you friends? Mm -hmm. And a friend is one in which there is a relationship. Could you comment on that? Mm -hmm. I think that that's a good place. Yeah, I don't think we negate. So what would we say if we said, if we say having a personal relationship with God seems off? And if, and if we're going to go so far as to say that that's an error, okay, then what would be the opposite error? 
we have no personal relationship with God whatsoever. Absolutely not. You know, if you talk to God as an individual, he'll never hear you, right? So, okay. So what we've done then is we've, we've, kind, of, we've kind of got the two different ditches we want to avoid, right? So then, then what does it look like, biblically speaking? Well, certainly there's the commandment, uh, or there's Jesus' words in regard to his reckoning us as friends. But it's, it is also very clear that our Lord Jesus wants us to have a relationship with him in a corporate sense through his church. So it's never just me and my Jesus. It's always me and the other disciples and our Jesus. Similarly then, where does Jesus want to relate to us? Where does he want to have a relationship with us? And here for Lutherans we say, well, in his word and in his sacrament. That's precisely where he says, I'm going to speak to you in my word. Um, in many and various ways of old, God spoke to his people by the prophets. Now in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, the words of Jesus, the Holy Scriptures. And then also um, the Lord's Supper. Because we believe that the risen Christ is truly present with us, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am. And he is giving us uh, his sacrament, his own body and blood, serving us in this way with the forgiveness of our sins. And this is where we then have his promise and his word that he is with us and giving himself to us. And so, but again, even that's not really exclusively personal. No one ever communes alone. Um, when we commune, we're communing with one another, we're communing with the whole Christian church. We're recognizing that our relationship to the Father means that we have many siblings in the faith. We're all children of God. So there are lots of different ways to challenge this idea of a personal relationship with God, which generally speaking means what? I'm going to be, I'm going to be a little rude here, a little forceful with the way I put it. How is it in any way distinguishable from an imaginary friend? Maybe not. I mean, you kind of you kind of talk to him. You assume he kind of you know talks back, and you know it's this little th it's this thing you do in a little kid when you're a little kid. You know, like ah, you know, God, if you want me to do this, then I'm going to make this basket, and if you don't want me to do it, then I'm going to miss this bat. You know, and all these little games we play, and it again, I, I I'm going to be a little offensive here. It's as if American Christians never really grew up. We're simply teaching. We're simply acting as though God is. And Christ is our imaginary friend. Quite different than having a relationship with God the way he intends us to, through his word, through his sacraments, which can be, I mean, to take nothing away, it can be entirely powerful. It can be entirely engaging. It can engage your emotions, and it can engage your mind. And it can be a very personal and moving experience. Um, but these are the ways in which God wants to have a relationship with us. And then we recognize that it's never just me, but it's always me along with the other disciples, along with the Holy Christian Church. So that puts us in the middle of those two errors, doesn't it? We're not saying, hey, you can't have a personal relationship with God, A, but we're also saying, hey, you know, we go too far when it's this, God is my imaginary friend. Yes, I see a hand. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I've, I've got an order of operations here. We'll get to you, I promise. Uh, two thoughts I have. One, you ruin the invisible man. <laughs> That's the one. And the other is when you have this um, personal uh, revelation from God, yeah. it always ends bad. Because um, I'm just thinking of all, all the right. prophets and they got killed. So. Oh. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if I want to make that case. I don't know. That sounds challenging. Well, there is something to be said of that. You know, if, if you're... So, so this is the kind of language that I hear all of, all of the time. And maybe you've heard this kind of language too. God has put this on my heart. Okay. How do you know it was God? Other questions. Did you hear a voice? Uh-oh. Was it just a feeling? Was the voice inside your head, outside of your head? Was the feeling inside your head? Did it have anything to do with what you ate for breakfast that morning? Or, I, 
there's more questions there. And see, we just take it at face value, don't we? God laid this on my heart. Oh, well then who am I to disagree? No, no, have you, what does that mean? Tell me what that means. Tell me what you experience. And, and in probing this, what you're going to find is that it's questionable as to whether God did actually lay that on their heart or as to whether that's just a thought that they themselves had. That they think is so important they want to attach God's name and God's will to it, which then is an abuse of the second commandment <laughs> and a certain kind of deification of my own thoughts and feelings. You know, plus it puts us in, an, I mean, that's pretty good psychological armor, isn't it? I really want to do this thing. I'm doing this thing, but I'm telling you that it's God who's laid it upon me to do this thing. So if anything goes wrong or askew or is weird or is awkward, well, hey, <laughs> it's not me. It's God who laid this on my heart. Yeah, so, so when we, I think we have every reason in the world to sort of question these things. I mean, every so often too, if you'll hear, you'll hear a pastor say, God wanted me to tell you. Oh, okay. So in what chapter and verse did God say that, that he wanted, you know? And then, and then if it's, well, no chapter and verse, then those old questions apply and apply even more so if it's someone saying, a, if it's a pastor in the office telling you that God said this, because then it's like, okay, well, tell me about his voice. How did it sound? Where did it come from? Was it a deep voice like we all think? Um, were, and, and here might be a good question too. What were you doing when he spoke to you? Well, I was just riding on my lawnmower. I was, I was playing golf. I was fishing at the pier. Okay. In the scriptures, when God speaks to someone, what is that person doing? on their face <laughs> almost all the time on their face or in awe or obviously like having an encounter with God whereas all of these supposed encounters with God that have, tend to happen on American soil are quite casual aren't they leads me to be a little suspect you know same, same thing true and you get the Pentecostals who claim to have all of these experiences with angels it's like well what did the angels say and it's usually this very casual, very kind of emotional, touchy-feely thing. It's like 99 out of 100 times when someone in the Bible meets an angel, the first thing the angel says is, do not be afraid. <laughs> and the person is usually, again, 99% on their face or otherwise having an obvious manifest experience. So, um, yeah, so color me skeptical. Color me skeptical with the claims that God spoke to me or God put this on my heart or, you know, etc. Yeah, but that's, um, I had two thoughts here. The moral high ground. If somebody says, God laid this on my heart and I, you know, and you say, well, we stand on the church fathers and they're going, who are they? You mm -hmm. know, they don't. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is every single time in my life, it's, it's like Chris said, every time in my life when I make a decision based on what I think God wants me to do, it always fails. <laughs> but then if I look back, I can see how my life has been orchestrated in a different way. I go, well, how did that happen? Mm -hmm. You know, why did that come together the way it did? Mm -hmm. and, I, and then I marvel at, at God. But I, I have one thing to say that's kind of um, heretical. About 50, <laughs> about 50 years ago, sure. in this very church, on that very pulpit, Mm -hmm. We had a pastor here who said God spoke to him through the vacuum cleaner. Oh. And I remember sitting in my chair and going, huh? <laughs> what did the vacuum say? Oh, my goodness. Well, he's gone, but he obviously, say. I'm not going to say. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, there, there were some wild times, particularly in the 70s. Was it yeah. in the 70s by chance? Oh, early 70s. Yeah, so in the early okay. 70s, um, what you had was the neo-Pentecostal movement. Yeah, yeah. And it was... Uh, as is typical for American Lutheranism, we should be a little ashamed of this. Um, what we like to do, we being like broadly speaking, not what we here at Faith Lutheran Church like to do, what we like to do is go rummaging through what the evangelicals have just thrown out. And they had just gone through and were just kind of finishing the giant Pentecostal movement. And so a bunch of Lutherans were like, oh, look at this. This is, found this in the trash. We could use this. And so we had our own attempt to have the Pentecostal revival of God speaking to me everywhere. The Holy Spirit's poured out. You know, I'm a very spiritual person. And, um, but again, none of this, none of this 
I think it fails at two major points. It doesn't, it do, it doesn't stand up under any level of scrutiny. Right, like what do the vacuum cleaners say to you? <laughs> okay, it doesn't, it, and then second of all, and then second of all, as one looks to the scriptures, it, it, one can see how alien it is, right? Oh, yeah. Okay, yes, and then we've got to go all the way in the back, and, and then I see another hand, yeah. Just a quick point. It's interesting to me, the two times I know of that in the Old Testament where God did speak to people, they botched it up pretty bad, and that's uh, Abraham. In, uh, took it in his own hand. Yeah, took it in his own hand, and so did Jonah. Just, uh, I don't, I hear you, but I'm going to do what I want to do. <laughs> well, yeah, they, it, I mean, the... Again, the point that I would the point that I would drive home is that the the prophets to whom God speaks, or the various fathers or personages to whom the, to whom God speaks in the Old Testament, are quite unique. A and B, the things that God is saying to them are are pertinent directly to the coming of the Messiah and the uh, the storyline of the scriptures that lead us to the Messiah. So you've got to analyze these. I mean, this isn't this isn't like you know, God, God telling me that I should be an architect or, you know, yeah. and that's it, right? The, everything that God does where he manifests himself and reveals himself in this, in this sort of way um, is to the point of Christ, not to the point of my own personal fulfillment or well-being, right? And then again, that verse I quoted earlier, in many and various ways, God spoke of old to the prophets, so that's what we're saying. But now, in other words, something's changed. We shouldn't expect that. Yeah. Now, in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. And again, that doesn't mean that then the son becomes this, hey, whatever, whatever I think the son is saying to me, he must be saying to me. But specifically, the son in and through the New Testament scriptures, in and through his apostles, um, the red letter words of the scriptures. This is what we cling to. Okay. Um, okay, all right, all right. So I was probably seventh or eighth grade, and I was in the little 7-Eleven across from the Lutheran school I attended, um, which I hardly was ever there. And um, I was approached by some well-meaning uh, Christians who asked m myself and my friends, you know, did we know Jesus? And, and I said, yes, I know who Jesus is. And i sure I said he was savior and you know died for my sins and they said well but have you said the sinner's prayer have you asked him into your heart and that was new to me and it confused me and I'm like well but you know um, and then then I go home and at night I'm like it, it scared me so I'm like Lord if you know, I'm saying at night if I haven't done this right well obviously I didn't know but I did have it right and I went on with life but then I looked back and I realized years later that they didn't realize but at the church we attend every sunday we make that group communal confession that we're a sinner mm. and we need you so we were saying their version of a sinner's prayer <laughs> every sunday and any time during the week that it occurred you know but then i did go over and uh, attend that ch a church of that kind for a number of years 10 years probably and met lovely people and some good Bible studies, so I'm not going to put them down or anything. Mm -hmm. um, what was it? Okay. And then you hear that speak, the speak of the Lord. And what that tends to do, if you go to like the church I grew up in, I used to like to go back there all the time because I had friends and family there. And you don't hear the God said this, God said that. So then churches like a Lutheran church or a Presbyterian church gets the, we get termed as dead churches. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, it occurred to me not too long ago, it's probably because you don't hear that terminology, right? Mm, yeah. Right. Um, so years after that, I'm at my niece's home and I hear this woman speaking about going back to her mom's church. It's a dead church. And by then I was already aware and God had already brought me back to a more clear understanding. So I politely went over and, and informed her that most likely the church her mom was attending wasn't a dead church. I'm not sure what, what reason. I, I'm not sure it wasn't just good. Anyway, so the Lord grows us, right? That mm -hmm. kind of like you said earlier, how do we grow in our understanding? Well, right. 
<laughs> right. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, I had a similar experience. Remember the, the prayer of Jabez, that whole thing? And I talked to some people. I think I was like early years of college trying to figure everything out. And they were so convincing. I remember like wrestling with this. Like, why would I never heard of this? And, I, and I'm laying in bed at night. And I'm like, God, if you got a whole bunch of stuff up there that I'm not getting, because <laughs> would you please just like pour it down? You know, I mean, it makes you so insecure because you're like, what is this? And was I was I lied to? Was I, yeah. Yeah. In hindsight. Yeah. Then you realize, right, as you I mean, as, as I grew, it's like I, I realized that these things come out about every five years and it's just this thing or that thing or the other thing. And it's all it's all based on bad theology and everything else. But yeah, interesting. Interesting. I like the way you put that, that uh, confession absolution is our is our weekly sinner's prayer that we pray. And it got me thinking, too, we have a weekly altar call. The Lord's Supper, where we, <laughs> come to the, we come to the altar. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think that you're right. Um, I think, in fact, that's very insightful, your point here on uh, when we're talking about the sufficiency of scriptures, the idea that if the Holy Spirit, if God isn't speaking to you outside of the scriptures, then you're dead. Then you're a dead church. You're a dead Christian. Isn't that something? I mean, wow. Wow. It's really an incredible statement, isn't it? Um, whereas if you simply cling to the scriptures and say the word alone is sufficient, Christ my Lord is sufficient, his word and his sacraments are sufficient, and if he hasn't spoken to me, then he's left me free. And he's promised to forgive me, and he's promised to bless me, and he's promised, you know. And, and then you're going to say that that's dead? Nah, uh, I think rather that the opinion that that's dead is in error, right? Yeah. Thank you for those comments. Very insightful. Uh, I, I'm, I'm good. Okay. All right. Well, since we're uh, since we're j just chatting a little here, I'll you know I'll add something else in. Um, I don't think it's I don't think it's one of Wolf Mueller's observations, but it may be. Uh, and that is that is this interesting kind of inversion that's taken place. So by and large, churches that tell you like you've got to discern God's will for your life in, in all of these aspects they generally are decision theology churches, okay? So you can make a free will decision for God, but you can't make a free will decision for all the other aspects of your life, who to marry, where to live, what to do. Do you, do you see the inversion? Now, I, ironically, we as Lutherans will point out that the scriptures flip this entirely on its head. You can't make a decision for Jesus. Jesus said to his disciples, you did not choose me, I chose you. So the one thing that we can't choose is the one thing they say we can. <laughs> and then when the scriptures actually give us free reign to choose Christian freedom, to choose a Christian spouse, to choose a Christian vocation, to choose where we might live and the other particulars of our lives. Again, these same churches are binding our conscience saying you have to discover God's hidden will. You can't discover God's hidden will. That's kind of a mean joke anyway, isn't it? And certainly nothing a loving father would do. But rather, rather we want to replace then this bondage of our consciences to discovering the hidden will of God with the freedom of a Christian that God promises, I will be with you. And I'm going to forgive your sins. And I'm going to, uh, in effect, back your play. I'm going to work out all things for the good of those who love me. And so you really can't mess this up. It's a, it's a beautiful kind of freedom. Yes, okay, now I'm seeing the hand in the back. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll struggle to be concise here. So with regard to right thinking about discerning God's will, how should we think rightly about the role of our conscience? Because definitely we all have that small inner voice, and you earlier said we have to be careful about who's talking to us. Mm -hmm. So we know, you know, that's question A, how do we rightly think about that? And then with regard to God's will, a lot, I feel a lot of people fall into wrong thinking around prayer then because it's I'm going to pray and see if God gives me an answer. How can we rightly use prayer? Obviously, you know, my understanding is that we're being submissive to God's will, giving him, you know, how do we write? Think we, how do we think rightly about prayer? And then lastly, is there any right thinking about metaphysical is there metaphysical thought? Is there power in our words? There's a lot of pagan practices out there right now about, 
Your words are powerful. You can manifest things. How do we rightly think about that as well? Okay, so these Sorry, are great. It's pretty these are great. I, I'll try to I'll try to treat them as succinctly as I can. Okay, the second one was prayer. The third one was the word. The first one was. Oh yeah, conscience. Boy, each any these these could all three be like an hour long. I'll, I'll try to I'll try to. <laughs> these are great. These are great. Okay, con conscience really fast. Conscience is analogous to an organ. Okay, it can grow healthy or unhealthy. It grows healthy, and the conscience's health can be measured by uh, how in in keeping with God's word it is. So if God's word leaves us free, the conscience is free. You know. Um, if, God's, if God's word binds us, says you must do this or you shall not do this, then the conscience grabs a hold of that. And insofar as a, a conscience is aligned with God's word, um, then it's healthy. But the conscience can become abused and uh, unbounded from God's word in two different ways. Of course, in one way, it, it no longer detects sin where God says it's a sin. And we see example of that in, in Romans, um, or you know, that language of God giving them over to their desires and that kind of thing. Uh, that's a deadening of the conscience. The other way the conscience goes askew, though, is it starts to see sins where there aren't sins. Paul is addressing this with a lot of like the eating and drinking and the, hey, you're sinning, no, you're sinning, no, that came from an idol, no, that was uh, not free range, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that was inorganic. <laughs> um, yeah, so the conscience can, can become unbounded in that sense too, right? So the, the healing of the conscience then comes um, from God's word. And that's really how we all together heal and maintain the health of our consciences, keeping them aligned with God's word. So it is true enough because the conscience is an organ, you don't want to just go out and abuse it. Because the conscience as an organ can't really tell the difference. It's, it's kind of like your lungs, you know, it can't really tell if you're breathing in pure air or cigarette smoke. They're just lungs, you know. The same is true with your conscience. So you don't want to trample your conscience even when it's wrong. Even when it's, um, and here it particularly, even where it thinks there's a sin when there's not a sin. Okay? And that's Paul's language, like if you think it's a sin and it's not a sin and you do it, it's a, it's a sin to you. Because you violated your conscience and, you, and in your mind you've separated yourself from God in that respect and right, your conscience is defiled. Yeah, so, so there, that's when we want to acknowledge conscience. Um, where conscience is saying something is a sin that God has not said is a sin. Where we don't want to acknowledge conscience, right, is, I mean, and I've seen this, people get so twisted up, it's like, well, I'm married, but I've got a, you know, a, a mistress on the side, and if I let the mistress go, my conscience would be defiled. I have to follow my conscience, Pastor. Uh, yeah, no. <laughs> so, right? So there's that aspect, too, where, where, no, you need to violate your conscience because this is all baloney. Um, that's the technical theological term. Yeah. yeah. So this takes some fetching out. But again, this is, I mean, this is why God gives pastors and why God gives us this understanding. And, and this is really where pastors are compared to physicians. It's very frequently in the realm of conscience. That's really what we're talking about and trying to identify where the conscience is and then how, how best to address that with God's word. Does that help answer that aspect? Totally agree with you on your second point about prayer. The more you adopt this, the less you can hold, you adopt this biblical understanding, right understanding, proper understanding of the sufficiency of scripture, the less you start trying to discern God's will um, in, your, in your life through prayer. In fact, we pastors are, the, are probably the worst at teaching this because what happens, um, and here I'll just, I'll, I'm gonna focus for the sake of it on Lutherans, I think it's much broader than that, but Lutherans, when, when a pastor receives a call to another church, okay, now he has, the, our theology is, he has two calls from God, he can choose which one he wants to serve. And there's, you know, there's some ways we pastors think about that, okay? And we think about like, all right, well, God has given me a certain skill set, um, certain, you know, I, I, I'm a given age, I've got a given energy level. Where can I be a good steward? Where is my family going to fit in? Where is this, how best am I going to serve the kingdom, right? This is a good and godly way to proceed. But what do we pastors say instead? Something really stupid. We say, I'm going to pray about this and try to discern God's will. God's already made his will known. You may serve here, you may serve here. There's no further revelation from God. Okay, um, All there is, is a revelation of where you choose to serve, and you come to that precisely by processing through um, where, where, is, where would I like to 
be a good steward of, the, of what God has given me and where do I think I can serve the kingdom in the best possible way. That's it. That's the discernment period. Not discerning anything in God's will. God's already made his will. Or is God tricking us? I mean, because that's your alternative. Is God said you can serve here, you can serve here, but one of them is a trap. <laughs> what? I, this is so ridiculous. So we pastors are to blame. Um, you know, and, and of course, pastors in other denominations is different dynamics, but it's the same thing. Like, let me pray about that. Let me see what God says to me. All of this is hogwash. If you can't point to a chapter and verse, then God hasn't said it to you, okay? And you need to just simply take ownership of your own free choices and take ownership of those verses where God says, I will be with you and I will bless you and I will forgive you your sins and I will prosper the work of your hands and cling to those promises, right? So yes, prayer very much um, not trying to discern God's will or which is right or which is wrong according to God. Very frequently, if, if God hasn't, well, all the time, if God hasn't specified, he's leaving us free and free to do those, those kinds of Christian reflections of where can I be a best, uh, the best steward of, of the gifts that God has given me, right? Make sense? Okay. So that's prayer, okay, on that, that topic. And then, and then third is the word. And what was the specific a aspect? Oh, the name it, claim it, kind of power of your words, manifestation stuff. Yeah, strictly speaking, no, this is paganism. These used to be called spells. We've just, <laughs> we've just... <laughs> We've just reordered and reorganized it to where if I say this thing or these words, it's going to happen, right? Or we've just deceived ourselves in a modern way. And the ancient world would recognize these right away as spells or conjurings, curses or blessings. Um, no, we, we as Christians, we just don't have any time or any room for that whatsoever. Of course, um, so what's the closest biblical tangent? You know, whatever is noble, whatever is true, whatever is right, whatever is good. It, set your minds on these things, right? So, so to let, to let the, the new man that God has created in us, to let the abundance of that new heart flow from our lips in order to prosper the people around us, to set our minds, our psychology on the things of God and thus have a well-ordered mind. Um, all of these things are good and God-pleasing and right, and we could talk at length about any one of those. But this whole idea of like manifesting things and claiming things and speaking things so that they happen. I mean, yeah, th this is just paganism. And where Christians have adopted this, they've done it completely uncritically. And it's, it's a disaster. Yeah. Not to put, put too fine of a point on it. <laughs> All right. So uh, great questions. Great questions. Are we, are we ready to, uh, to move forward a little with with sufficiency. I'm, I'm going to simply pick up where we left off. Second paragraph from the bottom of 45. We'll finish this section out very quickly. American Christianity expects God to let me know what job I should take, whom I should marry, what I should order for breakfast, all apart from scripture. American Christianity fails by teaching that there is a word from God apart from the word of God. You know, and, and none of this too, I should say, none of this is meant to ja take a jab at God's providence or the idea that God so orders things to bless us. We're not, we're not talking about that. We're talking here in the sphere of revelation, whether he reveals these things to us or not, or th or we're supposed to you know, discern his will so that we then perceive his revelation. That's what we're talking about narrowly. Of course, God's providential care for us is not in question. All right. Jesus teaches the sufficiency of the scriptures. Consider the story of Lazarus and the rich man. They both die. The rich man goes to hell. Lazarus is carried by the angels to paradise. The rich man somehow sees Lazarus in peace. He begs Abraham to send Lazarus back to his brothers so that they would see him raised from the dead and believe. The conversation unfolds like this. Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, no father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, Neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. 
Moses and the prophets, that is enough. The scriptures are sufficient. We rejoice that in the Lord's word, we have all that we need for life and salvation. All right, that's uh, sufficiency in a nutshell, and obviously much, much more could be said. This is intentionally a, a short treatment um, of this. I think you could write an entire book just on this section alone. Uh, but I am thankful to Pastor Wolf Mueller for what he's given us. Any other thoughts on sufficiency? No, please. So um, in the big lettering where it's um, scriptures are not sufficient to answer the question, what is God's will for my life? So I'm assuming scripture is sufficient to answer. And then, so, and then Moses and the prophets. So, mm. so what Scripture tells us is law and gospel. Is I mean, what yeah. Is so, our what will? does God say is our is His will for our lives? Yes. yes. Yeah. I, to be to be maybe a little simplistic about it, I would say look to the Ten Commandments. That's that's the Father's eternal will for us. And again, the Ten Commandments understood as the natural law. I mean, we don't have to, not by the letter of those commandments He gave to the Jewish people that we have to somehow um, have Saturday as our Sabbath, not like that, right? But the spiritual principles that lie within those commandments, um, that's God's will for our lives. And I think that that answers the question. There are more specifics like, like, hey, what if I realize that God has given me the gift of celibacy? Should I get married or not? We can turn to the scriptures and say, Paul would say, no, don't. Use your energies towards, uh, towards the church and towards the spreading of the gospel, right? Um, so there are specific instances and circumstances that the scriptures themselves flesh out for us, but the core of it would be the Ten Commandments. Make sense or no? But, yes, but also for us to be saved. Uh, what do you mean? Uh, Oh, yes. Yeah. So if you're, yeah, I mean, if you're broadening the question out to like, what is his will for us? Not merely in this life, but the whole big picture, then of course, you've got the, you've got the gospel included. You've got the resurrection of the body. You've got the new heavens and the new earth. You've got all this beautiful teaching that even now we're, we're like embryonic, you know, compared to what we shall be. The creation is groaning as if in travail for the revelation of the sons of God, the the last day of Christ is, in a sense, a birth of the new human race of which we are part. And so, yeah, we could flesh this out extensively um, in terms of God's overarching will for us. I think the way the question's used here is, tends to be, and just, you know, popularly speaking, is like, what does God want me to do? And particularly, these questions seem to pop up at the major transition from childhood to adulthood. They tend to pop up less, I think, as we age and settle into our various vocations. Um, but again, I think the Ten Commandments in general and then the other statements from Scripture that explicate those commandments are sufficient. Yeah. If, this, if the Word doesn't say, then you're left free. And I know that that freedom can be terrifying, but then go to what the Scriptures do say, that God is with you and He promises to work all things for your good. And yeah, we can move forward confidently. Yes, sir. Um, are we, hold on. Let's. We have to have the entire World Wide Web benefit. <laughs> yes, Jesus does answer this question. Um, he says uh, in John chapter six, twenty-eight and twenty-nine. So they said to him, the Jews, uh, what must we do to be doing the works of God? And Jesus answered them, This is the work of God that you believe in Him whom He has sent. So that's. <laughs> to echo. Right. <laughs> yeah, right, right. If you're looking for an answer right from uh, our Lord. Okay. Are we, uh, are we good on that? Let's, let's jump a little ways into efficacy, because this is the big one, according to Wolf Mueller. So, page 46, and we, we won't even attempt to finish this today, so we'll get into this uh, much more next week. The scriptures are efficacious. This is the most important of all the attributes of scripture, and it is lost in American Christianity. American Christianity understands scripture as information, but it has no power unless we act upon it. This accounts for the great number of ifs in the preaching of American churches. If you accept it, 
if you receive it, if you commit yourself. The scriptures tell us what to do, but it is up to us to make it count. For American Christianity, salvation is a potential. God gives you the information in the Bible. Now it is up to you if you will follow the instructions and be saved. Sorry, I'm I'm having a I'm having a side thought. A, a lot of the a lot of when when pastors will will and then in counseling in American Christianity, then they'll say, well, you know, I am sure that if you take path X or path Y, then God will bless you. Um, this is His will for your life, and and you go about it and you do it, but then you find yourself disgruntled or in a dead end or it doesn't work or you, you know you the school rejects you and you can't get in and then you were just told that this is God's will for your life. Where does that leave you? And then you go to the pastor and you say, okay, well this this clearly wasn't God's will, and you said it was. What does he say? Well, you must not have met the conditions, <laughs> because there's always this implicit if. You know, if you are faithful enough, if you follow in every, you know, and there's, so this if reminds me of just this great con man um, mechanism that's at play in all of this, where you can always then blame the victim. And, I, and I've seen this repeatedly, where pastors give some sort of extra biblical advice, and then if it doesn't work out, they blame the victim, and they say, well, you didn't follow the condition, you didn't meet the condition, you didn't follow the path exactly as you were supposed to. So I'm sorry for that digression, but I was getting irritated about that again. <laughs> All right. So uh, continuing with Wolf Mueller in the larger print, if, however, the Bible is the very word of God, then it is a different kind of word. That is, it's not mere information. That's the point. Most human talk is descriptive. But God's word is creative. I can tell you if it is light or dark, but God says, let there be light and the darkness becomes light. Pow, his word creates, his word declares. God's word makes things happen. This is the testimony of scripture about itself. I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, Romans 1.16. Faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ, Romans 10.17. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, 2 Corinthians 4.6. Come out, said Jesus to Lazarus. John eleven forty three, and he woke up from the dead. Be still, said Jesus to the storm, and the waves went to sleep. Mark four thirty nine. Believe, says Jesus to you, and you believe. See Romans one sixteen through seventeen and Ephesians two eight. The power of the word of God was not simply for the beginning, when the voice of God created the cosmos from nothing. The creation continues in his word and the preaching of the word today. Paul writes, For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. 1 Corinthians 1.21 The word of God, and here Paul is talking about the preached word of God, is the instrument the Holy Spirit uses to save. The Word of God is the means the Lord uses to work to create and sustain faith, to deliver spiritual gifts, to convict us of our sin, and to comfort terrified consciences. In the beginning, the Lord created everything ex nihilo, out of nothing, he continues to create out of nothing, and this includes our faith and our salvation. Okay, here, one of the main points that he brings up, the efficacy of the scriptures is the teaching that God's word has power 
and authority. The Bible is much more than information. The scriptures themselves are active. God's word is the sword that the Holy Spirit is wielding in the world. Okay, and that um, this will this will turn what happens on Sunday morning into a three-dimensional experience. Again, if you perceive that it's not simply the Word of God being read to you, it's not just the Word of God telling you about God, but that it is actually the living voice of the living Christ speaking to you, a gospel proclamation and a powerful word that is uh, going forth into your ears, into your heart, and into the ears and hearts of those around you. So this is a, this is a big deal, and one will flesh out uh, in contrast to American Christianity next week. Until then, the Lord be with you.